We're so excited to announce the launch of the Prism Bible app on January 1st, 2024. If you're looking for a new Bible learning experience, we'd love for you to download the beta of our new app. It's available for both iOS and Android and free for a limited time. Check out the Prism Bible app today. Today we see Jacob's sons try to get rid of their father's favorite. And so begins the amazing story of Joseph and Judah on The Bible Brief. Jacob's sons aren't paragons of virtue. We saw the firstborn, Reuben, sleep with one of Jacob's concubine wives. And we saw the next two brothers, Simeon and Levi, commit the murder of men in a whole city. Sons one, two, and three have all committed awful sins. And today we're going to see son number four join them. We'll meet this son number four, Judah, and the favorite son of their father, named Joseph. Two names that we'll be saying through the rest of the book of Genesis. At this point, Jacob has settled in the land of Canaan. After his final experience at Bethel, the birth of his youngest son Benjamin, and the sad death of his favorite wife Rachel, he's finally settled in the land. No longer fearing Esau, no longer dealing with Laban, but now working with all his sons. And in his eyes, no son was more prized than Joseph, the oldest son of his deceased wife Rachel, the son he'd wanted ever since he'd set his mind on marrying Rachel. The son he'd wanted, seeing the years of her barrenness, and the son he rejoiced over when he was finally born. Joseph was the apple of Jacob's eye, and everyone knew it. Let's begin reading in Genesis chapter 37. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of his brothers to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Even in these first couple of sentences, we can sense the tension in the story. The favoritism of a father is leading to the bitterness in his other sons. A hatred so pervasive that they couldn't even speak in a peaceful way to their brother Joseph. They felt, perhaps, unvalued compared to their younger brother, which was apparent because of the special robe that Jacob had given this favorite son of his. But then, Joseph began to have dreams, and the dreams make everything worse. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now what Joseph saw in his dream was stalks or sheaves that all the brothers were harvesting in the field. And apparently from what they had harvested, Joseph's sheaf stood upright while the brothers' sheaves bowed down to Joseph's. An odd sort of dream, but the meaning was so plain that the brothers immediately knew the implications. They think that Joseph believes he will rule over them, and they grind their teeth with more hatred before the next dream comes. Then Joseph dreamed another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. With Joseph's second dream, he actually becomes a bit of a concern to his father, too. In this dream, it's not only eleven stars that bow down to Joseph, but the sun and the moon, too. 
Again, it's somewhat apparent given the numbers involved what this dream is really about. His eleven brothers and his parents will bow down to him. And it's with this dream that Jacob rebukes Joseph. Yet despite his rebuke, the text tells us that Jacob kept the saying in mind. A clue to us that we should keep it in mind, too. Joseph was dreaming that he'd be the ruler and the prominent one among their whole family. And while his father gave him a light rebuke, his brother's hatred was stirred up even more. Joseph had to be stopped. And then, opportunity knocked. Sometime later, Jacob sent Joseph on an errand out into the fields of Canaan to go find the older brothers who were keeping watch over their flocks. But as he approached them on that fateful day, the sons of Jacob hatch a plan with unforeseen consequences. It says this, They saw Joseph from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. The brothers immediately begin a plan for murder, before the firstborn of Jacob suggests an alternative. We read, But when Reuben heard it, he rescued Joseph out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. He said this to his brothers, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Joseph is minding his own business, doing the will of his father, when the brothers decide to hatch a plane to kill him. Yet Reuben, perhaps trying to get on the good side of his father again, after sleeping with his father's concubine, well, Reuben suggests that they should rather throw him into a pit so that they won't have blood on their hands. Apparently, he was secretly planning to come save Joseph from the pit. Perhaps he wanted to show his father that he'd turned a new leaf and was still worthy of his father's blessing. And yet, while Reuben is gone from the area, the scene develops further as the brothers get an idea from Judah, Jacob's fourth son. Let's listen as they're all sitting down for a meal near the pit where they had thrown Joseph. Then the brothers sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. The fourth son of Jacob, Judah, sees an opportunity in all this. He wants to keep his hands clean. He wants to somehow profit in this betrayal of Joseph. And last of all, he wants to get Joseph out of the picture for good. So he suggests selling Joseph to some passing traders, who happened to be very distant cousins through Abraham's son Ishmael. They could take him and do what they wanted, while the brothers could avoid direct injury of Joseph. While we don't have all of Judah's motivations explicitly given in the text, it's not hard to imagine his reasoning here. He knows how upset his father Jacob was when two of his older brothers murdered all those men in that city. He knows that Jacob heard of Reuben's sin with Jacob's concubine. All three of his older brothers had done grievous things against their father, which meant that Judah was perhaps in the running for the great blessing of Jacob. As the fourth son after the other three, he was next in line, and he didn't have anything tarnishing his name yet. The only thing that was in Judah's way was the favorite son, the favorite son Joseph in the pit with his fancy robe. What better than to remove him from the picture? What better than to keep his own hands clean in the process? What better than to gain a little profit, too? While Joseph's life is about to get significantly worse, things were looking up for Judah. Let's keep reading. When Reuben returned to the pit 
and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes in grief and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe. Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Then he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father wept for Joseph. As deceit seems to run in the family, we see another example as the brothers put the blood of a goat that Jacob had given to his favorite son. Then they show it to Jacob, letting him draw his own conclusion. Upon seeing the blood-stained robe and imagining the cause, their father immediately begins mourning for his lost son. The oldest son of his favorite wife is dead, and he refuses to be comforted. He'll be mourning for the rest of his days. Joseph was dead. But we're left with a final note in Genesis chapter 37. It says, Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. The story of Joseph isn't done. It's just beginning. But along with his story, we see further development of Jacob's fourth son, Judah. Judah, it turns out, will be a man on which the story of the Bible turns, but not before he has his own share of twists. Join us next time as we see Judah hit rock bottom as he sleeps with an apparent prostitute, while Joseph in Egypt resists a similar sin himself. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.